Hey, what's up? Hey, Kevin, how's it going? Good, how are you? Sorry, let me get you in here. Oh, no worries. Thanks for talking to us today. Oh, my pleasure. These are, these are so great, so cool that you've Thanks. been doing these. Yeah, it's been super fun. Um, how's your day been? How's your weekend going? Oh, you know, uh, it's been good. It's been good. I taught a little bit today, and that was cool. Um, that's been nice to kind of be doing that again a little bit more. Um, <laughs> other than that, it's been quiet. You know, I think probably similar. How about yours? Yeah, pretty much the same. Just taught some students. and nice. You're doing that mostly on, on Zoom or something. You know, I, yeah, mostly on Zoom. I hate to admit that, I mean, because I feel like there's there's the gig shaming or whatever, but the, but there's one student that I've been teaching like with masks and stuff like that. I feel and, like that's that's safe. Is it guitar? Like that's safe. I feel. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's guitar. guitar. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, totally. Well, could you uh, tell us a little bit about like what your career has been looking like during the pandemic? Like how it's affected and everything. Well, <laughs> I think uh, I think kind of like everyone, it's been pretty. Uh, desolate um i think um you know i think i did pretty well like i i coasted along and i was pretty busy until like two weeks ago and then it just completely cliffed yeah you know? but um i have such a variety of stuff at any given time that things sort of uh kept going a little bit um and and there's been some stuff that's been going i, I do some work for uh, Bill Frizzell and those sweet folks and, and they've kept me on even though there, there's not a lot happening even for him. I mean he's busy but you know there's not a lot to promote or like you know there's there's no gigs really so yeah for, um, but they've kept me on and then uh, there's been some sound stuff there was some streaming I'm still doing a little bit of the live streaming for Dazzle mm -hmm. so that's really fine um, doing audio engineering for that but even, you know, even that has kind of trickled off a bit. And it's, it, it sort of feels like, I'm sure you're the same way. It's like kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop, you know? Yeah, totally. Could you but, tell us a little bit about, I mean, your career is so diverse. And I'm curious, you know, how you got where you are starting out as a guitarist, finding your way into the recording industry and booking shows. Like, can you kind of give us a general idea of kind of how it all took shape? Sure, sure. Just kind of like how it got started and everything. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I guess I, I mean, I got interested in guitar. I was like a friend, you know, 13 or 14 or something like that. Showed me some stuff. Um, and then, you know, you get a guitar for your birthday and, and you just kind of figure it out on your own, or at least that's how it worked for me mm -hmm. for about a year. Um, I grew up in New Mexico uh a town called Farmington and there's just like not a lot of music happening there um but I was fortunate to have a good teacher a good couple of teachers really uh Gordon Peck was a guitar teacher and he taught at the community college there mm -hmm. and so he kind of got me going and got me into when I was still in high school he got me into they had this band that like played basically like every outdoor local event you know whatever it would be like a festival or whatever they were like all the outdoor things mm -hmm. and they had like a truck and a trailer and a sound guy and a roadie and like the whole thing so it was like sort of you know professional working band but um still a college affiliate you know mm -hmm. um so that was kind of interesting and in retrospect it's like you know even back then like we were on in ears and stuff it was like wow it's wild but um so that happened he gave me some records um like kind of blue and uh just all kinds of stuff but one one around that time you know he got me into undercurrent that jim hall and bill evans record huh. this feels like a tangent but like it all kind of no oh, yeah tangent but, uh, away. <laughs> So basically that, like, he hit me to that stuff. Like, I discovered Jim Hall and Bill Evans and Miles and training and, like, all this stuff through him, you know, in kind of, not podunk, but really kind of podunk New Mexico, you know. Uh -huh. um, so then I decided I wanted to move, and I have family from Denver, so I moved to Denver uh, when I was 22, I think. 
and uh, basically came to just like check out more music, be around more music stuff, go to school, like do all that. Mm -hmm. um, and then one day, I think I'd been living here for a few months and I walked by Dazzle, um, the old Dazzle on Ninth and Lincoln. And I heard someone playing piano in there and I walked in and it was, it was Jeff Jenkins. Oh, cool. A Friday lunch thing. And I was the only person there. Wow. And he was like, you know, anything you want to hear? And I was like, Days of Wine and Roses? And he's like, I think he was kind of taken aback. He's like, okay. <laughs> so we played it and then I met Donald and kind of, I got hired there as like a server and then immediately got hooked up with Steve Denny, who was working at the time, great piano. Uh, and he became the music director. Tyler Gilmore was still there when I first started. And he left and Steve moved into his position and I moved into the assistant position. And then Steve was there for like a couple of years and, and then he moved, moved on and moved to New York and all that. Um, so basically that, that was kind of it. Like I had a bunch of records and then, you know, through high school, it was public library. Like I ashamedly, you know, but I checked them out, but I, you know, I, I ripped off like all the ECM records, uh -huh. you know, the cover, like you could see it. And it's like, the, the same old story everyone tells us, like, you see it, you're like, what is that? Right. And, and then you hear it, and it's like, you know. So, and around that same time, someone gave me um, this great engineer. Uh, in New He was living in New Mexico. I think he's still down there somewhere, but Dave Goins. Uh, and he was, like, an engineer for, like, all these crazy people, like, uh, you know, like, toured with Cheap Trick, and, and then he was, like, the front house, you know, the main engineer for Sean Colvin when she was huge. And anyways, he gave me a copy of Blues Dream, that Bill Frizzell record mm -hmm. that, that opens with Ron, your next week's guest. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so that's when I got hip to Bill and Ron and, you know, and then coming here, I was like, oh, Ron Miles is here. So Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So, so then it kind of like split out. From there, really, I mean, there was the Dazzle thing, and then I was going to school at UCD as a guitar performance major. Um, so hanging out with all those guys, Sean McGowan and Paul Musso and Drew Morrell and all those people mm -hmm. who I already knew from Dazzle. Right. I would so love really, to hear... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I was just going to say it all kind of came from, you know, Jeff Jenkins playing The Days of Wine and Roses. I guess. That's awesome. <laughs> I would love to hear about your time at Dazzle as the music director and like maybe sure. the favorite shows you remember producing and maybe sure. some challenges that that you found maybe helped you later in your career when you were that you dealt with while you were in that position. Sure. Wow. That's um That's like we'll... five questions, but yeah. No, it's good. <laughs> it's good. Like there's so much there. I mean I first off, like the whole Dazzle thing i mean it would be remiss not to you know give kudos to donald rasa the owner over there just because like you know i feel like we did some very cool things um there and when i was there you know there was some cool stuff that happened and it seemed like there was kind of a uh i mean it was already on a trajectory from tyler and steve but it like you know it certainly seems like it went pretty pretty rapidly but um you know, so Donald, for having the faith in, you know, 20 somethings to like deal with all of, all of that. Uh -huh. <laughs> so shout out to him. But um, I think maybe we'll start with favorites. Sure, yeah. I'd love to hear some favorites. Well, I think I was thinking about that earlier today. And one, and I had to look up the year, but I remember it was April 10th, but it turns out it was 2010. Okay. And it was, um, my Polish is really bad, but I think it's pronounced Tomasz Stanko, but T-O-M-A-S-Z Stanko, S-T-A-N-K-O. So he played there and, and he's from Poland, but he, that was the day, like he got, flew into town and that was the day that the Polish president and like his wife 
and I think a bunch of people in like government, top government positions, like his cabinet kind of, all unfortunately passed in a plane crash. Wow. Yeah, like that day. So then he went and played and there was all these Polish people there and, and I loved his music anyways. He was one of those ones that like I found in the library, you know, he's on, he's an ECN guy, he was, he, he passed a few years ago, but, um, and that was a very, very, his music kind of heavy anyways, but it was very heavy, mm -hmm. like everybody crying, uh -huh. you know, it was intense. Um, and Steve Denny actually booked that, not me, oh, but I was cool. there for what it's worth. Um, and then there, I mean, there's so many others, um, but I mean, Jim Hall, just cause I'm a huge, like he's, that's, there's no one better, you know, than Jim, but, and then he, you know, then of course that he, he, uh, he really set an example, you know, a lot of the stuff is like, don't meet heroes and things like that, but he, uh, man, what a, a an incredible human being. Um, and at a time when he was, you know, he was like 82, maybe, <laughs> or 81, some, something in there. And he had had back surgery and he like really physically he was not that great, he was not doing that well. But he was the sweetest guy. And like Paul Musso helped me like drive those people around. Cause that was the other thing about the Dazzle Gays. Like I would go. And it was like you book the show and then you'd go you'd promote it and then you'd go to the airport and pick them up mm -hmm. and take them to the hotel and then you'd go and set up for their sound and then go get them and come back and do the sound farm and then make sure they're but you know it was like all this stuff right but uh man he was just the sweetest guy and then afterwards he sent me the nicest i have it somewhere he sent me a letter it was like <laughs> incredible you know that's so cool yeah and, it, and he like I, it's a great regret he invited me out to new york he's like oh i live close to the vanguard like come down we'll go to the vanguard and i <laughs> you know he died like a year later and i didn't it's like i should have you know jumped on a plane <laughs> totally, totally. <laughs> like, but anyways so that one um some of the other ones were ones that were like not uh well attended <laughs> you know there was some cool stuff that like w was just kind of a we were a little bit in front of the curve on it um but one that that became better attended the second time but it was brian blade's mama rosa band mm -hmm. i mean those the, that was a that's a great if you haven't checked out that record that record is so good it, it's everyone kind of like not looks down on it, but it's, you know, he doesn't play drums. He, he plays, it's his songs and he plays guitar and, and there's this great, incredible drummer named Stevie Nister on it. And it's more like a songwriter thing, mm -hmm. but that stuff was so good. I have the, well, I shouldn't say that, but uh, there were a lot of bootlegs made at Dazzle. <laughs> and some of those made it my way. And that's the only one where I like, I'll listen to it occasionally. It's like, man, so good. I'll check that album out. That sounds amazing. Yeah, it's a it's a Daniel Lenoir produced record. I mean, it's cool. it's great. Brian's and and the Fellowship. I mean, the Fellowship shows are always like, yeah. That's actually a perfect example of like the thing. It's it's kind of hard to narrow them down because I don't remember. It's like until we start rattling through them, I don't remember them. But because right. I saw so much music there, which I'm so thankful for. I mean, and it's so incredible. But one thing in particular, like Mama Rosa, like they would do three or four nights usually, and, or not Mama Rose, excuse me, the Fellowship Band, mm -hmm, yeah. Brian Blade and Myron Walden and all those guys, John Coward, uh, Chris Thomas, that, that band. And um, to get to see like four nights of shows, two sets a night, like to see the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I remember Ron, Ron Miles and I talking about that at the point. He's, you know, that's like, I would say to like every CCJA kid in the world. Like if and when we, <laughs> we get back to like clubs and stuff, like don't just go to one set, like go save your money. If it's the band you love, like go to all of them. Mm -hmm. 
just go to all of them because the way things develop, like with, especially with people on that level, like in the way, I mean, there's just so much about it, like set construction. Mm -hmm. I mean, I learned so much about that. I, I wish I would have written it all down. Because, yeah. I mean, the way people put sets together and then the way the thing develops and, which is also goes to, goes to like, talk about, um, not blowing smoke, but, but truly like Convergence and Ken Walker, like, cause, I mean, cause they were there, Convergence the first Friday and Kenny the, the last Friday of every month for, you know, seven years or yeah so like to see that too i mean because i mean don't those guys are very 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 heavy yes, you know? they are. <laughs> so like to hear them what they did you know across time because it, it's the classic thing you know they're all like running it you know you're like you're running from teaching or whatever you know they like fall you know it's like Paul Romain, it's like he falls into a room, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, but, but it's just the nature of like trying to make, make things work, mm -hmm. you know? But, so to see them like come in and like sight read the book and then like throw audibles and just uh, all of that. I mean, yeah. it's, um, that made me think of another one, the, uh, the, about a year after Jim Hall passed, we did a, uh, a tribute gig which which I really tribute gigs are like I, I've got a weird I, I have a funny taste in my mouth but it was what happened was I mean Dale Bruning like he and I he's a huge Jim Hall guy too so like when he passed it was like you know we both like were you know on the phone and it was like oh man you know that was rough but so it was like hey we need to we should do something, but let's wait. So we waited, it was almost a year later, just to, you know, so it's not the cash in tribute. Thing right, right. So much, but, um, and then Bill Frizzell came out and it was Paul Romaine and I'm gonna, I might screw this up. It was Paul Romaine on drums, Mark Simon on bass. Uh, it was Ron Miles, Dale on guitar, Bill Frizzell on guitar, and then John Gunther, I can't remember if Gunther was on that. I know Mark Patterson was on it. But anyways, that stuff was beautiful. And they, they did a version of Concerto that, again, it was like made everyone cry. Yeah. It, was like, it was incredible. It's incredible. But yeah, so there were a lot. What were, you, what were your, I mean, I remember seeing you around there. What were some of your shows? Um, I remember like at the old Dazzle. Yeah. Um, I saw Gerald Clayton there and it was like the first time I took my friend to Dazzle. She'd like never been there. And yeah. She was like, this is the coolest place I've ever been. And she like loved that show. And I remember loving that show so much. Yeah. I that got to meet Jimmy Heath there once. Yeah. There's like a picture in the CCJA office with like nice. me and like a couple other CCJA kids and Jimmy Heath like all hanging out over by the, the side tables, you know? <laughs> Yeah, man, he, Jimmy. Yeah, and then I think I think yeah. you booked me for like my first solo gig ever there. Like, oh yeah, right. I was right. a sophomore in college, and I was like, "Can I play a solo gig?" And that like helped me gain a lot of confidence. So, oh thanks nice. for that. It was like a big thing for me to be able to jump into something like that. Um, yeah, that's that's a. I'm sorry because like now I've played solo gigs and they're so hard. Oh, it's okay. Like I needed it. I remember like being in yeah, yeah, with yeah. Eric and I was like, I can't do this. And he's like, you literally can. You just got to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, you just have to go and, yeah. you know, like fill every ounce of space, <laughs> you know, not like overplay, but you know what I mean? It's like oh, yeah. solo is yeah. so hard. I also hosted the, the jam session with Todd and Joey Perlman, and it was the oh, yeah. night 2016. It was like, it was a crazy night at the old Dazzle. It was like the last time I hosted the jam there, and it was the election, yeah. and we were all just like, 
it was a heavy night. It was crazy. Man, yeah, there's so, yeah. It's funny how a lot of that stuff is like, is tied in that way, you know, mm -hmm. um, where it's like the, even that Tomasz Stanko gig is like, you know, I mean, I'm sure I would have loved it because I loved his music, but, but the, the outside event, like, right. you know, and that's something that the audience, it's, it's sort of about the audience really, mm -hmm. you know? and like where they're at and some audiences like uh, sometimes it's just you're just uh it's just flat you know right. like the most amazing thing can be happening and 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 it just doesn't catch or something mm -hmm. you know? yeah i know what you mean that's one like um and talk about being in front of the curve um where donnie mccaslin played like this was a while you know i don't even remember but it was the exact same band that played on the david bowie record <laughs> i was at those donnie shows i was at like one or two of those i think yeah right and it's funny because then there's like all the people that you see there that like stay and don't leave because you know that's the other thing is like people would leave like people would just be like this is you know not just that show but right. a lot of you know anything that was like the least bit edgy like it'd be like no polka dots and moonbeams, you know, <laughs> you know, so that show is like another great one where it's like the people that stayed, you know, it's like you're, there's so much cool stuff happening that maybe doesn't translate mm -hmm. for an audience, you know, but anyways. Yeah, that's awesome. I love hearing about all those shows. Um, can you talk about some challenges that you or things that helped you later in your career and in other ways that you learned at Dazzle? Yeah, I, honestly, um, kind of all of it, you know, I mean, we can, maybe I'll just feel free to interject. I'm just gonna like kind of ramble in on it a little yeah. bit. Um, I think a big part of it is like learning that uh, number one, like the world is a really small place, you know, so, so a lot of the people that you interact with, like, it, it's, you know, it's, it's really less than six degrees of, you know, Kevin Bacon or whatever. It's, it's very, yes, yeah, there's a lot of connections that you don't even know about. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, you know, I think trying to be not just do your best, but like to try to be, you know, a, a good, kind person, you know, yeah. all the time, which goes without saying, but, but I'm prefacing this with the next part, because I know like there were times when I was just like, you know, there's so much going on and it's, it's very overwhelming. Um, so when you, when I went in, it's like, you know, going from someone who's like, you know, early 20s and like, you know, what do you get like four or five, like maybe four or five emails a day that are like actually something mm -hmm. to getting like, you know, 60 to 80 a day that are all like, you need to respond to these people, you know, so, so even that, like just being like, okay, you have to like, just knuckle down and do the work and you have to like do it quickly and you have to respond quickly and and one thing for me that's hard is just like you know honestly just saying no to people yeah um, is, is hard you know and learning that you can't just be like yeah maybe you know right you know it's uh, it's best just to be like and i feel like that's a western thing and and denver i think is like this especially but you know, rather than just be like, meh, or don't respond or whatever, just be like, hey, you know, I don't think it's the right fit or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is. If, even if it's like, you know, someone's calling you for a gig, it's like, hey, you know, I don't, you know, it's, uh, it's a thank you, but not my thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So learning that and learning task management and time management. Because um, I was in school while I was doing that. Um, for undergrad and that was like kind of 
too much. Really. A lot. <laughs> it's like a lot, a lot. Um, so it was, you know, there was definitely, I mean, like I, I think like Thursdays in general, I didn't really sleep that much, you know, because it was, there was like ensemble on Fridays, you always had to learn music and, you know, mm -hmm. so you just do what you had to do, but, um, so I think that, like, just strapping in and doing it. The other thing is, like, learning about, I mean, there's so much of what I do now that's totally it, you know, learning about promotion um, and what a moving target that is, you know. Learning about um, logistics and production management, you know. Um, because it was really, I mean, I always had an assistant, but it was always, it was really kind of a one-man band there. Uh, I shouldn't say that. I had an assistant, and then I had this other guy, Roger Harmon, a great classical guitar player, a great musician. And he would do, like, the weekly email blasts and mm -hmm. stuff. And in hindsight, it's like I should have just, like, pawned off way more stuff. But, yeah. <laughs> um, so maybe to delegate, like, you should delegate, you mm -hmm. know. But, uh promoting production management uh logistics uh just correspondence i learned so much about business i learned about vetting contracts um learned about negotiation uh learned about booking shows like you know like what feels like a good thing and there's a lot of intricacies in like just actually booking a show mm -hmm. and then uh transparency and especially in communication um how to relate to people like how to talk to people a lot how to public speaking like yeah. <laughs> you know, there's so much so i mean uh, anything jump out that you're like Let's start there. Oh, I mean, that's all such good advice. And like, um, one thing you mentioned that reminded me of like, one thing Maria Schneider brought up when we spoke to her recently mm -hmm. was like, that sometimes you just have to sit down and do it and like get to yeah. it. And I think yeah. that's really good advice. And yeah. yeah, it sounds like that job kind of just like taught you everything. It was like the school of dazzle to like. Totally, yeah. totally. I it totally did. I mean, like I had a little bit of experience in all those things, you know, before that, but, you know, to go from zero to 900 miles an hour, like, you know, yeah. um, it's pretty hard. And, and then also, I think one thing that it really teaches you, and one thing that I see, like, I don't get that, you know, people don't ask me like questions about that stuff that much, but occasionally, and it's, the one thing I would say, like, to, to everyone is, uh, I often feel like I don't know why I'm in a certain position or in a place. Mm -hmm. But I think the thing that, like, I guess what I mean is, like, what is your job title, right? Like, what are you here specifically to do, mm -hmm. you know? In a lot of situations, that's not abundantly clear um, for me. Um, but I think the thing to always keep in mind is just to do whatever the situation calls for. Mm -hmm. So like to not put things beneath you, you know what I mean? Yeah. So like if it's, you know, if, if you need to, you know, crawl in the dirt to go whatever, or, you know, if, if you need to clean up a spilled mess or like whatever, you don't, you just do it, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and I and I think that's something where people like that is worth more than than I think maybe people might recognize. Yeah, you know? I totally. Especially young folks, it's like you know, that's like the age old thing about like audio work as well. You know, it's like you got to push cases or or push a broom or you know whatever. You got to mm -hmm. do some grunt work. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. And um, I don't know, it seems 
like a big thing. That's funny. Known you for 34 years, I'm still not clearing your shop. Yeah. Me neither. Yeah. Me neither. <laughs> I would love to hear more about like post dazzle what you've been doing. I know you just worked on Rainbow Sign. And yeah, right. I'd love to hear about your stuff with Bill Frizzell. Kind of just anything you want to get into about what you've been doing now. Sure, sure, sure. So when I I left Dazzle, I was just honestly I was just like very burnt out, um, and I just kind of needed a break. And there, you know, there was just a thing where it was like I had just done some. We did some, actually with CCJA, some bigger outside shows. We did Bill Frizzell at East High School mm -hmm. and did him again at the Oriental and, uh, you know, put all those together. And that was so much work. And they were like very successful and everything, but it just was, you know, just like, man, okay, what's, what's next? Yeah. But um, so I left there and I didn't have anything. And I, I had like a couple students you know, and that was like it. So it was like kind of starvation there for a minute. But um, then I was helping out with Bob Ross over at Ross Double Bass. And he honestly, he was, he just gave me a gig because it was like, you know, <laughs> you need some money. <laughs> uh, you need something to do. And um, so then I was just practicing and doing all that and then working for him, teaching more. Um, about a year after I left Dazzle, Phyllis Oyama, who is Bill Frizzell's manager, and her husband is Lee Townsend, the producer, um, and they own a company called Song Tone that, that they represent Bill and Carrie Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. So they invited me to go out to, to San Francisco. Um, they live in Berkeley, so East Bay, but Bay Area, and stay with them for a few days. I think I stayed like four or five days or something. And so we just hung out and like, Honestly, that was, like, we just hung out. Yeah. <laughs> like, we went on walks and stuff, you know. I think we went to, like, SMOMA, maybe, you know. Like, we just kind of checked stuff out. Um, and then they were kind of, Phyllis, like, really was kind of like, like, hey, you know, you should go to grad school and come to grad school here, you know, <laughs> and you should be around. And so I was really considering that, and then, I kind of just decided not to do that. But then they called me anyways and were like, well, hey, will you, would you mind working remotely for us? Cool. Um, doing social media for Bill. Because mm -hmm. they had some pages, but they weren't really doing anything. You know, Instagram, they had zero posts, mm -hmm. you know, like seven followers or something like that. I don't know. Um, so, of course, it was like, sure, you know, of course. Like, you know, a freelance gig you can do like on your own time, mm -hmm. like Bill Frizzell and Lee Townsend and Phyllis Oyama, like, you know, these are incredibly intelligent, creative, like constantly searching people, like, of course, mm -hmm. you know, and Bill's like a hero, he's, and Bill's, Bill's the best. So I started doing that. Um, and at that time he was on, okay, he was on Sony. So OK Records, which is Sony, is the parent, mm -hmm. and then uh, and then also ECM. ECM was doing some stuff, and then so that was kind of interesting, you know, going through album cycles, you know, which if folks aren't familiar with the album cycle, basically it's just like the promotion and touring involves every time an album comes out. So seeing like you know ECM, like here's how they do it, and here's how Sony does it. And I think that's actually Sony Classical is mm -hmm. like the parent. But anyways, big, you know, mega corporation. Um, super nice folks. And and that was the other thing that, again, came up. is like, oh, everyone is incredibly great and, like, super sweet. And it's like everything is cool. Like, it's not like this, you know, it's sort of true what they say. Like, people that are jerks, it's like, they man, they don't it doesn't hold water really, you know, it doesn't, it just doesn't, it's not effective. Yeah. Um, so that's how I got involved with him. And then I've been doing that ever since and just been, you know, I've, I've known all those folks, Phyllis and Claudia Englehart, who is Bill's tour manager for many, she's been with them for many years since the early nineties, I want to say. Mm -hmm. 
I've known all of them for, you know, going on 10 years, but, you know, it's just been so cool to be like, kind of a, that whole thing is kind of a family and it's, it's very cool, that whole scene. Um, and then Ron, you know, talk about one of the best, but he, um, we'll get to Rainbow Sign, but basically back in the Dazzle days, so Ron brought Bill and Brian Blade out when they did that first trio record, Quiver, mm -hmm. uh, with Colin Bricker at Mighty Fine. So I had known Colin peripherally since then. And then again, when I left Dazzle, he like the summer after was like, well, hey, you want to you know, do some sound gigs? And I hadn't done sound gigs. And I was like, sure. Yeah. So I started working for him in the summers, which it kind of worked out great because it was like, you know, you teach in the winter. And then as you know, like private teaching just falls off in the summer. Oh, yeah. Um, so it was like, <laughs> so I do sound gigs in the summer, teach in the winter. And that was sort of how I was supporting stuff. And they're playing gigs, you know, but you know how gigging, it's like, I mean, there, there's just not a lot of, you know, unless you're a bass player. Right, you know? there it is. <laughs> um, but so that was kind of how I was doing it. And then I just worked for Colin for a few years. And then he got to a point where Colin Bricker over at Money Fine, they have the studio and I was doing live gigs, just all kinds of stuff. And then it kind of gradually became like kind of more throughout the year. And then he got to a point where he wanted to buy this staging company called uh, Marshall Austin. So like the stages that you see at Five Points Jazz Festival, mm -hmm. those outdoor mobile stages. So he, he wound up buying a company that had four of those. And, um, and he hit me up to go on salary to like be uh, run that company first and foremost, and then like, you know, do sound stuff mm -hmm. in the cracks, you know? Um, and I was wanting to buy a house at some point, <laughs> you know, like sort of try to figure some things out mm -hmm. um, in terms of like, you know, long-term because it, I'm sure you felt it. And, and I think everyone that's done any kind of freelance can feel it like, at a certain point in Denver or New York or any like city, it's like your rent just keeps doing it. You know, eventually it's like, you're just gonna get squeezed out, you know, or, you know, so, so that was on my mind. Yeah. It's like, how do you figure that out? So I took that gig for Colin and then uh, I've, I mean, I've learned so much from Colin and everyone. I mean, everyone I've worked with, I've learned so much from, but, you know, learned a lot about live sound, a lot just from doing it. Um, and then a little bit about recording stuff, but, but I never really spent any time in the studio until the pandemic started. Uh, oh, okay. And then just doing streams, you know, I mean, I'd been in there like setting up and tearing down, mm -hmm. and, you know, basically, um, just doing intern work basically yeah um but then i got into the recording stuff and started doing sound for like the denver pops orchestra and people like that and they would record it and then go back and mix it and doing editing and doing all that stuff so cut to ron like i guess that was a year a little over a year ago like a year and two weeks ago mm -hmm. Um, he had the material for Rainbow Sign, what would become Rainbow Sign. And uh, a gentleman by the name of David Breskin, who I think it's called the Shifting Foundation. But anyways, they he'll come in and ex essentially executive produce records. So like put the money up. All right, we're going to do it here. Well, Ron wanted to do it at Mighty Fine, but you know, the it's Jason Moran, Thomas Morgan, Brian Blade, Bill Frizzell, and Ron. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Ron lives here. Brian lives, I think, in Shreveport. Um, but then everybody else is there. So basically, after going back and forth, it became, well, Colin, fly out to New York. We're going to record it at Sear Sound in New York City. And um, when I heard that, I was just like, oh, well, like, man, 
can I go? Uh -huh. And so I asked Ron, you know, I asked Colin, he said he was cool. So I asked Ron, he said he was cool. And it was, you know, so I went out and I, you know, we did it, we recorded it. There was a rehearsal and then two tracking days. And basically I was just in there. Uh, Colin engineered the session. Um, I can't remember his name. He's great. Um, the staff engineer there like helped and got everything set up. But basically, you know, I was there and helped set up and helped tear down and talk to Ron. You know, I mean, he would ask questions or, you know, what do you, what do you think, you know, or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, how are you going to tell like, Colin and I were joking about that. Like, what are you supposed to say? It's like, <laughs> those guys just play. You're like, yeah. Like, yeah, sounds good. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, I think the only thing, I mean, Colin had some stuff that made it on the record where he was like, oh, you know, maybe Bill, like, you know, maybe like do some loopy stuff here or whatever. And, and I think Colin and I both had a conversation with Ron where, and I don't blame him, you know, it's, it's hard when that band is playing like Jason Moran, Brian Blade, Bill Fuzel, and Tom Morgan. It's like, what do you add? You know, <laughs> like, right. you know so, so I think that was the thing the only contribution I would say that if, if I really had anything in that record, it was just like being like, Hey Ron, you know, like you should play, you know, like <laughs> not that he wasn't playing, but you know what I mean? It's like, man, give yourself a, another solo, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. it doesn't have, you know, that's so awesome. Want to do, you know? yeah. <laughs> like, so that, and then that became, you know, that record was made and was not, you know, he could tell you the full story on that. I don't, I don't know all the back end stuff really, other than what he's told me. But, you know, it, it was homeless. You know, it, it wasn't like it was a record label was decided up front. You know, basically they they just Don was heard it, and then I think he he heard it, loved it. I think Bill sent it to him, mm -hmm. and then everything started from there where yeah. it's like oh you know which is so i mean so happy for ron yeah me too it's so cool incredible. you know blue note yeah <laughs> crazy so so yeah that's how the ron stuff came out but but you know a big part of my thing at mighty fine was doing sound gigs but then a lot of it is just again going back to like oh well don't be afraid to do stuff you know i mean a lot of it is just like contracting and doing stage work, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that trying to keep the stages working. Although this year, you know, we haven't, we didn't do a lot. But, yeah. Um, so, you know, there's that. And then it's like, you know, a lot of the gig over there for like those big festivals and stuff is like, is putting out fires, is going and getting a PA or whatever tuned and started. Mm -hmm one else you know which which i think everyone would sort of uh a lot of engineers can can attest to that, that like nice. if if you're not the person that's with the band like you're you turn it over you know yeah like whoever's doing it at least at a certain point you know? which gets into a whole other thing of like you know doing sound for bands you've never heard before mm -hmm. um, could talk a lot about that, you know, um, and, and, you know, not being the, the, I mean, the crusty sound person, uh -huh. you know, so many of them are, you know, and, and I'm probably guilty of that at times too, but, you know, in general, just trying to be a decent, cooperative, collaborative person. Yeah, totally. You know, so... Well, I'd love to kind of shift a little bit and talk about your personal musical like goals or dream projects or anything you've been playing lately that's been inspiring to you. Let's sure. get more into that realm of your career. Sure, sure. Um, well, I haven't, you know, honestly, like the last two years uh, since I took the job with Mighty Fine, um, I have a tendency, same with Dazzle, it's like I sort of like just really go down the rabbit hole, you know, at the, at the expense of my own stuff, which is unfortunate. I think that, you know, there's certainly a level of like, you know, uh, 
um, shyness about it. You know what I mean? Because it's like, you know, you know how it is like writing stuff. You're like, oh, well, hope, hope it's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But so that's been coming back since the, honestly, since the pandemic, because there's a little bit more time. Mm -hmm. I mean, practicing again, which is super fun and kind of, again, a whole other subject, but like having a, a, a good relationship with playing um, now that isn't so, I, I feel like music school can really like load some things for you. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's like anyone, I feel like everyone, it's, it's almost like a, it's like an unspoken, it's like everyone, it's like taboo to talk about that stuff, but it's like, Art Landy once I took some lessons with him and he was like he's like yeah we we just have to unlearn everything you just learned and I, was like, and I didn't understand at the time but now you know I, I totally get what he's saying you know? mm -hmm. I guess really like now I've gone back to the thing of like kind of like back to the beginning where it's just like oh I just want to transcribe stuff you know but really just learn stuff by ear and check stuff out and um and without any real goal other than it's like, oh, you know, I've been playing a little bit with Colin and Kim Baxter, a great drummer. And, you know, but with, without any real goal other than just like, oh, you want to play free or like, you want to play that song or, you know. Um, and then in terms of like, goal it's it's sort of weird to have a goal right now because yeah. like, you know the goal is always like the gig you know it's like oh let's i'll book a gig and then right you know that's the thing you have to like get it together for but mm -hmm. there's just not that's not a thing really so, yeah. so i think for me one goal maybe i think because i have access to the studio to mighty fine and i think i would like to just write some stuff and make a record just just because I can mm -hmm. you know and it, and it would be a learning thing on both sides like the engineering side and the writing you know It'd just be nice to go write and try to come up with something else so mm -hmm. um so I've kind of been I'm like right on the cusp of that but the cool thing lately that I've done was for Evolving Doors Dance which is Amy Shelley and Angie Simmons that's their dance company and, and it's modern dance stuff but they just did this I mean really amazing I, I would suggest everyone go check them out but this really amazing thing called moving through that I was a part of mm -hmm. with um, Amy and Julie Royster and Karma Sanjin and that was like really cool all free but it was let's see, it was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So it was four nights mm -hmm. and it was two hours and you would start, it, it was just beginning and end and you had to play free the whole time. And it, you didn't play together. Like you were, I could kind of hear Julie, like she was in another room. I couldn't see her, but I could hear her. Mm -hmm. So we would kind of play together, you know, <laughs> but not but not all the time. Mm -hmm. And then there was dancers and you would play, you would accompany the dancers or play against them. I mean, it was just- Wow, that sounds so cool. It was really cool. I, I would, I was really, I've done stuff with them, like classes and things with, with Amy and Angie with Evolving Doors, but it, it, this thing was like, it was the first time I'd done one of their actual shows and it, it really kind of like, blew my mind both the thing and then also made me realize that I, I don't know about you but I I've always gotten this thing and I think this probably goes back to like my music versus my gig or whatever mm -hmm. is it's sort of like that like you're either doing this or you're doing this you know there's there's like an exclusivity thing mm -hmm. and that that gig really made me realize that it's like number one that like creativity transcends medium mm, like yeah. you're whatever your vibe is and you're like your creative thing like that's that can be across different mediums without being too like you know new agey and like artsy or whatever but but truly like it yeah. you know your creativity can be 
channeled in a lot of ways. Number one. And number two, like just that, that you can be like, you know, I know there's some vibe in the jazz scene about like, you know, someone has a day gig or whatever, but it's like, man, you can be this and this. So it's like, it's possible to be, you know, an engineer and like a music industry professional, an engineer and a guitar player and a, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, it's like, you can do multiple stuff. And maybe this is just me rationalizing because I've, <laughs> I've always had like, it's kind of a blessing and a curse, but I've always had just a ton of like a variety of interests. Yeah. I'm just like very curious all the time, a bunch of different things. So, so that's been bad in the sense that like, I'm not like, I can't just crush giant steps you know, or whatever, but in the same breath, like it's kind of been, I don't know. I, I've been able to figure out a way to be in a lot of different rooms, you know? I think that's a lot of incredible people. Yeah, I think diversity is really important as a, to have a lot of skills to be able to kind of get from situation to situation, especially like in this uncertain time, like having, having yeah. all the other skills other than being a killing musician are also equally as important and being a good person and everything you've talked about, I think is, is How? important. Mm -hmm. Totally. You know, I, I was thinking about that too. Um, there's almost a thing like, you know, you and I, it's like, we have a conception of like, because of the pandemic, you know, it's like, we have a, a before times conception. Right. You know, so, so, so there is, I've had this feeling for like high school students where I'm like, Oh man, you know, that's so rough. Like if you're coming out right now, like yeah. oh, man, that's rough. But then I also, a couple of days ago, I kind of realized it was like, well, you know, just like there's a learning curve, you know, you and I and like all of us of a certain that have been around, not a ton, but you know what I mean? Like they've been doing some stuff. We kind of have an unlearning curve right now, you know? <laughs> so, That's so true. So, so there's a thing where it's almost like the, you know, the you're coming into like an open landscape in a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, and who knows if, who knows, maybe we're all going to go back to like exactly the way it was. I don't yeah. know. But, <laughs> But there's almost a thing where it's like, I mean, kids are so resilient and I, I really think that there's almost like a thing where they're just going to be like, they're going to be blowing us out of the water because, yeah. <laughs> you know, like basically now, like everyone is a video editor, you know? Right. And, you know, so like everyone can make videos, everyone can, you know, so it's like everyone can do all the things that, you know, you need to like promote something. Mm -hmm. Like everyone's learning that. Right. You know, um, as a result of this thing. And, and everyone's learning more about like audio engineering and recording themselves at home and like yeah. you know, all the stuff. So it's, it's almost like there's a, it'll be very cool to see. I'm, I'm optimistic about it. Um, you know, guardedly, I guess. Yeah. But, but ultimately, I think it's, you know, I think it's going to be cool. And, and I hope it's going to be cool. Um, because I would certainly like to get back to live music and oh, me too. Know, traveling and you know, hopefully touring some more, you know, yeah. and all the things that were, you know, on cue now I'm yeah. waiting well I'd love to open up if anyone who's viewing has any like last minute questions we're coming up on an hour here but feel free to like drop those in the comments if you have any questions for Kevin um, one other little fun question do you have any albums jazz or otherwise that you've been really getting into right now like not even new but like things you've been really into just digging into, yeah. um, you know, you, you're, you're hipper than I am. So you probably have already heard of this band, but I just a few weeks ago discovered this band deep sea diver. Oh, I've heard like, I, I've, I've heard like one song. So I'm not hip really? at all. <laughs> that, that's been kind of cool. It's like, um, synth 
pop rock i don't know what you would call it but yeah it's it's pretty cool there's, there's one tune that like rhythmically i'm like i don't know what's happening there's some sort of polyrhythm but i don't i don't understand you know I, i'll have to ask you know i saw where colin's on the phone earlier i'll send it to him and be like what is this what is this <laughs> Oh, Chris, Chris is wondering if you have a, or maybe that's Paul, if you have a funny musician story from the Dazzle days. Oh, man. Like, yes, I have a lot of funny musician stories, but most of them are like off the record and uh, usually have a shade of inappropriateness. I'll tell you one, <laughs> one time, though. Um, Gosh, what would be a good a good funny musician story from Dazzle that's not super out? <laughs> <laughs> well, one time, so you remember that, uh, the Cookers? Remember the Cookers, mm -hmm. that band? I can't even think of everyone's name in that band right now. I remember George Cables, because like, man, he would come to the club at like noon and just like, he would play all day. Wow. Practice, but he just plays tunes. Mm -hmm. like, he doesn't like, he wouldn't be like over there like practicing skills. He would just play tunes, but um, and that was beautiful. Which there's another story about that involving Annie about another pianist that I'll tell after this. It's not funny, but just was like an example of the amazing stuff over there. But um, so those guys were like they're all pretty up there, um, and. I can't remember exactly what happened, but long story short, like we got to the hotel, it's like one in the morning or something. And I go and I carry their bags in with them. And I walk back out and it was like, I don't remember, it must've been winter or something. Cause my car was running, I don't know. But they got out, like after I loaded all their stuff in and they locked my keys in my car. <gasps> no. The cookers. Yeah. So Annie, the, the Annie story was like, um, yeah, there's a lot of stories that are super dark. This one is not dark. <laughs> but, um, another thing of people playing, like a lot of people would like come and play, especially pianists, because, you know, you'd be like, yeah, you can go use the piano all day, whatever. But Bill Charlap used to go and um, I haven't thought about this in forever, but he used to, after a set, like a lot of times he'd like, have a drink or whatever and then keep playing by himself mm -hmm. like so one time like he was i think annie had gone to the show maybe with her dad or something but she was sitting out in the bar someone was playing but i was like you know he just starts playing like all these old old tunes and so i remember pulling her in there one time and just being like hey you gotta like he kind of does this every time but like you're here like you should check it out yeah because <laughs> it's like bill charlap solo piano that's it's amazing like, wow awesome incredible stuff um there's one more question that came up which yeah. was i know this is going to be hard but can you do it top three albums of all time Ooh, top three albums of all time <laughs> that's a big big question yeah that is that's tough. Um, probably, yeah, it's kind of tough to narrow down like the, I mean, a Jim Hall record would be in there. Probably like These Rooms, which is a Jim Hall record with Tom Harrell. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. And um, probably, oh man, it's tough to get into the other ones. Maybe like, uh, Emmy Lou Harris, uh, Wrecking Ball. Oh, cool. That's one. Um, and then I don't know. The third one, probably. I'd probably have to, like, I don't know. It, it'd be a tie, maybe between, like, East West. The Bill Frizzell record that's two different trios and then uh probably like Neil Young Weld. Nice that's awesome. 
Yeah, probably those harvest. My mom chimed in said harvest. <laughs> yeah, but I think, yeah, actually maybe harvest. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it's a th it's a three way tie: east, west, weld, and harvest. That's awesome. <laughs> and then now I have to remember what the other ones were: wrecking ball and yeah, wrecking ball, east, west, harvest, weld. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Well. Yeah. And we're at about an hour, so I think it's a good place to wrap things up. And I just wanted to thank you so much. This was such a fun conversation. It was fun. Thanks so much for inviting me. It was you know, super yeah. great. It's cool that you guys are doing this, and, and I can't wait to check out the, the Maria Schneider one. I've... Yeah, I'm going to either post it somewhere or I can just send it your way. But, yeah, it was really cool. Um, awesome. Do you have anything you want to leave everyone with? Anything coming up that you want to talk about? Or, um, you know, there's I don't know that there's anything coming up that I would talk about, but I would I guess I would just, you know, I don't know. I guess given the times, I would just say, you know, just try to be nice to each other and yeah, support support local artists, and business, you know, which um we all have to kind of make an effort to do that because i i worry there's a lot of things i worry about going away and one of them is twist and shout records so. oh i used to work there it's like my favorite place really? yeah really? Oh, i remember when you worked there actually because yeah. i lived like a block away mm -hmm. um for a long time but you know artists museums musicians it's like man as as you know and all of us know like the music community and the music production community. I mean, we've all, uh, I don't think we've ever seen like harder times, you know, so it's just spread the word and everyone, you know, yep. give your, the nearest musician a hug and a $20 bill. I, don't know. <laughs> I like that advice. Yeah. <laughs> or what? maybe not a hug anymore. An elbow know. tap and 20 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. An elbow tap and 20 bucks. That's, <laughs> Everybody give, you know, a musician or an artist, elbow tap for 20 bucks. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, but but I guess Twist and Shout and West Side Books, like those are two places that are very near and dear to me that, you know, I would say, I hate to like plug something, but it's like, it's not like we have any gigs. Oh, yeah, it's important. You know, holiday season, buy a record and a book mm -hmm. from those two people or whoever your local version of that is, yeah. you know. Because <laughs> we need those folks. I totally agree. Well, thank you so much, Kevin. And I hope to see you soon once this yeah. is over. And I wish you health and happiness in this crazy pandemic time. That was a great textbook ending. But yeah, <laughs> same to you. Thanks so much, Camila. Thanks for doing all of these. It's yeah, great. totally. Have a good night. You too. Talk to you later. Bye.